Jack. Boom, boom, boom. Rich, poor, black, white, how you look. You can make it if American. Just do your stuff and do it well. Lots before us did it and we think they're swell. It's the spirit of America, the people that truly So I try to make the light in others' eyes my sun, the music in others' ears my symphony, the smile on others' lips my happiness. Let's see how nicely you can say this one. No. I forgot your A child who cannot hear must use other yes. senses to help him develop speech. Yes. So he tries to imitate what he sees and what he feels yes. because he cannot imitate what he hears. Yes. We're developing each blind child's individual worth to the fullest potential. Because each child has something to offer and a reason for being, we're helping them find that reason. You've seen some deaf people and some blind people. Young students like you, studying and practicing to be just as normal as anyone else. Have you ever thought of what it must be like to be deaf or blind? Suppose, well suppose all of a sudden you couldn't hear me. And if you couldn't hear my words, well, then you couldn't hear a lot of other things, too. Suppose you were blind. What then? Do me a little favor. Close your eyes. Come on. Are they all closed? Okay, now, with your eyes closed, let's pretend the final bell has just rung. And it's time for you to go home. Think you could manage it? Now, suppose that besides being blind, you were also deaf and you didn't know how to talk. What would you do? All right, everybody, open your eyes. I'm still here. We have someone very unusual to talk about today. Now, back in 1904, a young woman named Helen Keller graduated from Ratcliffe College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She was graduated summa cum laude. Now, you see, summa cum laude is a Latin phrase which means that someone has graduated with the highest honors from a university or college. Now, being the best student in a graduating class is quite an honored accomplishment. But in the case of Helen Keller, it was much more. Because, you see, Helen Keller was not only deaf and not only blind, she was both. And she won her top honors in open competition with girls who could see and hear. Helen was born in Tuscumbia, Alabama on June 27, 1880, a perfectly normal, healthy child. Her father, Arthur H. Keller, had been a captain in the Confederate Army, and her young mother, Kate Adams, was his second wife. Now. When she was 19 months old, Helen was stricken with a strange and puzzling illness. No one seemed to know what it was. Even the family doctor was mystified and secretly feared that Helen might die. But then, early one morning, as suddenly and as mysteriously as it had come, that strange illness left. I can't believe it. The fever's gone. Completely gone. Oh, thank God. Child, he's a killer. She's got the constitution of a goat. Is there anything we should do, Doctor? Just let her get well. She knows a lot more about it than we do. These things come and go in infants. You never know why. I call it 
acute congestion of the stomach and brain. I'll see you to your buggy, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Now, don't worry. The worst is past. I've never seen a baby with more vitality. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Oh, hush now. Shh. Don't you cry. <laughs> You've been trouble enough. Acute congestion, indeed. I don't know what's so cute about a little congestion just because it's yours. The wonders of modern medicine. They don't know what they've cured till they cure it. Well, we women will just have to... We'll just have to... Helen? Helen? Captain? Captain, will you come? Captain? Captain! What is it now? I don't know. Oh. I don't understand you. She can't see. Look at her eyes. She can't see. Helen? She can't hear you either. Well, I howled for you. She didn't blink. Not an eyelash. Helen? Helen? She can't hear you. Helen? I cannot recall what happened during the first months after my illness. I only know that I sat in my mother's lap or clung to her dress as she went about her household duties. My hands felt every object and observed every motion, and in this way I learned to know many things. Later I felt the need of some communication with others and began to make crude signs. A shake of the head meant no, and a nod, yes. A pull meant come, and a push, go. The Keller homestead, where Helen lived with her family, was called Ivy Green, because the house and surrounding trees and fences were covered with a beautiful English ivy. Our old-fashioned garden was the paradise of my early childhood. I used to feel along the square, stiff boxwood hedges and, guided by the sense of smell, would find the first violets and lilies. There, too, after a fit of temper, I went to find comfort and to hide my hot face in the cool leaves and grass. The most important day I remember in all my life is the one on which my teacher, Anne Mansfield Sullivan, came to me. It was the third day of March, 1887, three months before I was seven years old. On the afternoon of that wonderful day, I stood on the porch, dumb, expectant. I guessed from my mother's signs and from the hurrying to and fro in the house that Something unusual was about to happen, so I went to the door and waited. I tried with all my might to control the eagerness that made me tremble so that I could hardly walk. As we approached the house, I saw a child standing in the doorway. I had scarcely put my foot on the steps when she rushed toward me with such force that she would have thrown me backwards had not Captain Keller been behind me. Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan might never have met had not Helen's family taken her to Washington, D.C. to consult Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, an authority then on schools and teachers for the deaf and the blind. Incidentally, he was the same Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone. Dr. Bell advised the Kellers to contact the Perkins Institute for the Blind in Boston, Massachusetts, where a deaf-blind child like Helen had been taught not only to read and write, but by means of a finger alphabet to communicate with people who could see and hear. This the Kellers did immediately, and in a few weeks, a letter arrived at Ivy Green from the Institute with news that a teacher had been found for Helen. This was 21-year-old Ann Sullivan. Ann Sullivan, born in poverty, was the daughter of Irish immigrants. She lost her parents when she was eight years old, and then with her younger brother, Jimmy, was sent off to a poorhouse, where he later died. To make matters worse, Anne had been born with such poor eyesight that by the time she was 14, she was already reading with her fingers. While at Perkins Institute, where she was a student, 
she underwent a number of eye operations, which then allowed her to read in the normal manner for limited periods of time. However, she was constantly in pain because of her eyes, and near the end of her life did finally lose her eyesight. From the beginning of my education, Miss Sullivan treated me exactly like a seeing and a hearing child. The only difference being that instead of speaking words to me, she spelled them into my hand with her fingers. She is unresponsive and even impatient of caresses from anyone except her mother. <laughs> 